I do want to clarify there uh, for Shira and Stafford, uh, of course, uh, ejecting from uh, the Gemini 6 would not have meant a high altitude ejection. It would have meant a different kind of danger, which was ejecting off the pad. And the question there was, you know, would you actually get enough altitude for the chutes to open and fully inflate and, and get you down safely because you were ejecting from only 100 feet up. So that was, uh, <laughs> it was a very good thing that they didn't have to eject, not because they would have been going at Mach 2, but because they were at such low altitude. Well, they did, in fact, get off the ground successfully uh, on December 15th, 1965. There's, uh, uh, on the upper right, you can see the uh, Gemini 6 mission emblem, um, which shows uh, the, the stars that uh, Shira and Stafford were looking at in Orion and, uh, and uh, Canis Major, Sirius, the dog star, uh, as they were chasing uh, Gemini 7. And on the left there, you see the two spacecraft nose to nose. Shira and Stafford flew uh, a beautiful rendezvous, a perfect rendezvous. They closed to within one foot of Gemini 7, so close that they could even see Borman Lovell's faces through the windows of the spacecraft. Um, they spent uh, quite a few hours uh, flying around Gemini 7 and um, uh, exchanging greetings and uh, taking photographs and film from uh, both spacecraft. Borman and Lovell, of course, were doing the same thing. And here is some of that film. That was Frank Borman's voice, and there you saw Jim Lovell in the window of Gemini 7. Here is Gemini 6 pulling away, greatly sped up, until it is nothing more than a bright star above the sunset horizon. First space rendezvous in history, and this truly was a turning point for the U.S. space program. This was clearly something that the Soviets had not done. They had launched uh, Vostok 3 and 4 on a double mission that came within sort of within shouting distance of each other, but of course Vostok could not maneuver, could not change its orbit, and so there was no hope of a, a proper honest-to-God rendezvous on that, on that spacecraft. But here, uh, Shira and Stafford had accomplished it, and this was a, such a critical milestone uh, for Apollo, and uh, really uh, stands as the turning point in the space race. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, the, the Soviets had stopped flying. Uh, they were no longer flying uh, Voskhod missions. Um, it had been uh, more than a year since Voskhod 1, and uh, you know many months since Voskhod 2, but after that, nothing. And so uh, here was the uh, Gemini program establishing the U.S. almost as the, pretty much as the front runner, I guess you could say, by this point, and, and seemingly uh, without the Soviets chasing them. And of course, uh, another great milestone happened uh, on December 18th when Frank Borman and Jim Lovell uh, splashed down and were recovered after their two weeks in space, sort of uh, weak. Uh, and uh, unaccustomed to gravity, and uh, certainly suffering some uh, some medical effects from uh, two weeks in, in space in that very cramped uh, cabin, uh, loss of muscle mass and so forth that we would come to know as routine uh, aspects of long duration space flight, but but in great spirits and for the most part in in good shape and. Uh, certainly having proved as they walked away under their own power uh, from the recovery helicopter uh, that uh, astronauts could withstand two weeks in space, and that meant that they could fly to the moon, land on the moon, and come home and do that without uh, any significant problems. And this was certainly a giant step toward the moon. Well, I'm Andy Chaikin. That's uh, 
Gemini and Voskhod. We'll see you next week.